here we go with nomenclature using transition metals and polyatomic ions. All right, first using transition metals. Unlike main group metals, transition metals have varying charges. Okay, you have a list of these, the ones that you're supposed to have memorized. And because of these varying charges, there are different naming notations. We've got the classical naming. This uses endings OUS and IC to determine the lower and higher charges of a transition metal. OUS is for the lower charge and IC is for the higher charge. It depends on the ion for what that low charge is and what that high charge is. That's why you need to have them memorized. For example, the ferrous ion is Fe2+. Plus and the ferric ion is Fe3+. And then there's the new naming system. This uses Roman numerals to denote which ion is being used. So iron 2 ion is Fe2+, and iron 3 ion is Fe3+. Now it is very important to remember Roman numerals do not indicate how many of that ion are present in the compound. So if you have a compound that's iron 2 oxide, that does not mean that there are two irons. It means that the charge on the iron ion is positive 2. Very, very important to remember. So let's look at writing names if you're given the formula for a compound containing a transition metal. And remember, these transition metals are all those B groups in the middle of the periodic table, like iron and copper and cadmium and zinc. This process is much like before. Uh, when given a name, you're going to list the names of the ions present. How, now we just have to remember to use classical or new naming system to indicate the charge on the transition metal. So to determine the charge on the transition metal, we're going to reverse the crisscross method that we used before. So if we look at something like Cu2O, uh, we know oxygen always has a negative 2 charge. So that gives us the 2 as a subscript on copper in this compound. That's why it's Cu2. Now since there's only one oxygen, if we take that 1, that understood 1 subscript, and make it the charge on copper, remember it's positive because it's a metal, and metals form cation, we can determine the charge on copper is positive 1, making it copper 1 or cuprous. So we can name this compound copper 1 oxide or cuprous oxide. Now if we go the other way, writing the formula if you are given the name of the compound, again the process is similar to very before, or very similar to before. Uh, we're looking for Roman numerals or the classical naming cues to tell us the charge on the metal in each compound. So then we can write the formula for each ion and crisscross to assign subscripts, just like we did before. For example, we've got iron 3 oxide. Now remember what I said before, that 3 does not mean that you have 3 irons. It means that you have an Fe3+. Plus and then oxygen is always O2 minus. So these two ions combine to form Fe2O3, otherwise known as rest. Now if we look at the polyatomic ions, again you have a list of these to memorize. Uh, you're gonna, first we're going to be writing the names from the formulas. We're still going to use the skills skill we learned for binary ionic compounds. So if we look at this first example, we've got NaHCO3. Now remember, you have a list of polyatomic ions you're responsible for knowing. So you should be able to recognize that HCO3 altogether is a polyatomic ion. To name this compound, we're going to list the ions that are present. This compound contains sodium and bicarbonate or hydrogen carbonate. So the name is sodium bicarbonate. Remember, there are no changes made to the ending of the polyatomic ions. You just list what they're called. If we go the other way, writing formulas from names, uh, we're going to use skills just like before. List the formula from each ion represented in the name. 
So for example, we have aluminum oxalate. Aluminum has a positive 3 charge. Its formula is Al3+. Oxalate has a formula of C2O4 with a negative 2 charge on that polyatomic ion. So we crisscross again to assign subscripts. That gives us Al2, C2O4, 3. Now this looks a little different. Because oxalate already contains subscripts, we had to put parentheses around the polyatomic ion and put the compound subscript outside the parentheses. Otherwise, otherwise it would look like we have 43 oxygens, which we don't. We have three oxalates, each one containing four oxygens. If you run across a compound that contains both a transition metal and a polyatomic ion, all you have to do is combine your newfound nomenclature skills and you're going to be an expert.